This video is brought to you by GeForce Now, powered by Pentanet, which lets you play Warhammer 40k Darktide even if you don't have an Xbox or a PC. Click the link below to try it for free or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Doesn't that look fun? Hello and welcome to my preview for Warhammer 40k Darktide, the next big thing from Fatshark. I love that name by the way, Fatshark. I never get tired of saying it. Darktide is the follow up to the spectacularly popular and beloved Vermintide series. And at this time, Fatshark have abandoned the fantasy era of Warhammer and fast forward time like 50,000 years or something to arrive at the age of the God Emperor and the Hive Cities and the Inquisition and Nurgle, another name I never get tired of saying. I was fortunate enough to play this bad boy. I was recently in LA for the Summer Games Fest and there I was invited by Fat Shark to go hands on with the game. I got a chance to chat with the developers, in particular Victor Magnuson, who's the head of design for Darktide. I was the very first person in the world to play this game outside the studio, since before that, only Edge Magazine had had their hands on it, but that was back at Fat Shark HQ in Sweden. It was really funny because when I finished my session, I was like, hey guys, that was sick. This rules and they were clearly very relieved because developers always get really nervous showing off their game for the first time And I could clearly see that they were like, oh, thank God because yeah, it was super good I actually only meant to do one playtest session for it But I ended up going back on day two for more because I enjoyed it so much that I really wanted to nail this preview video I wanted to capture more footage try more classes speak to the developers some more And I'm really glad I did that because each new round I played through gave me more confidence that we're probably in for a pretty good time come September this year when the game releases on PC and Xbox where it will be a day one Game Pass release for both platforms so that's pretty cool. So in this video I want to cover a whole bunch of stuff, classes, gunplay since I know people are a little bit nervous about that, level design, story, as well as just a whole bunch of little things I noticed along the way that made me very excited for this. Before I begin, just a quick note on the nature of the footage you're seeing. Some of the footage was recorded by me at the capture event in LA, and that was my own gameplay. Part of it was other gameplay sent to me from the same event, but it wasn't actually me playing. I don't know who that was, by the way. So essentially, if you see someone playing really badly and missing all their shots, <laughs> that wasn't me. But if you see someone pulling off heaps of sick plays and looking like a total badass, then yeah, that was absolutely me. Let's go with that. Finally, there was some other footage in here that was sent to me by Fat Shark, and it's from an even earlier build of the game. And it's perhaps running on different hardware because it appears as though the lighting is a bit flatter and it's running at 30 FPS where I was playing at or above 60 FPS during my playtest. I can't tell you which system this other footage was captured on because I don't know, but I wanted to shout that out here so you know why some of the footage looks quite different from other footage. Finally, bugs. This was a pre-release build for a game that was still three months from launch when I played it in June. It had some bugs, particularly audio bugs, which you may hear in this video. Some clipping issues, some of the objective-based activities didn't quite function correctly, and a few other small things. That's not something to be worried about at this point in a game's development. I'm not saying that Darktide is going to launch bug-free. I'm just saying that bugs in a preview build are very normal, and nothing that I saw made me go, uh-oh, which is something I've definitely thought during other preview builds I've played through. My takeaway after spending time with Darktide was, wow, this looks and plays super well, hell yeah. It wasn't, oh hey, that's a lot of bugs, I'm really worried. So I just wanted to be clear on that from the outset, and with all that out the way, Let's talk about why I'm very pumped for Dark Tide. So I'm gonna be real with you and say that I never quite clicked with the Vermintide games for two reasons, both of which are kind of answered by Dark Tide in a way. The first is I don't love the fantasy side of Warhammer. Nothing wrong with it, just doesn't do anything for me. I'm more of a sci-fi guy than a fantasy dude, more Mass Effect than Dragon Age to put it in stark gamer terms. The 40k universe is not one I'm close to, but recent trips there through the likes of the impressive 40k Inquisitor Marta and the janky but ultimately enjoyable Necromunda hired gun have been enjoyable trips and each new 40k game that I play, I find myself edging closer towards going all in on this universe and really starting to immerse myself in its lore. Will I be buying and painting little miniature figures? No, I will not. But will I be playing more 40k video games and maybe reading a book or two? I suspect I will. 
That's actually one of the things I'm most excited about when it comes to Dark Tide because Fat Shark have made really clear that they're going all in on the storytelling and lore front here. And they've pulled in the right people to help out. 40k people will know the name Dan Abnett since he's one of the most prolific authors in the Warhammer space and he played a central role in Dark Tide since he's written most of the lore for it, going so far as to create an entirely new planet on which these events transpire. All new but still deeply connected to the broader 40k lore, this planet called Atoma Prime is overrun by what are essentially zombies but they have a much cooler 40k name that I can't remember now. They're just the fodder though, as you'll also encounter turncoat ex-military types and war dog things and giant mutant ogres and all sorts of crazy shit. Oh, and these dudes who are rocking the bulwark of Azanoth. I love it. Speaking of the Fat Shark developers, they really wanted me to know how committed they were to the story and the lore. They talked about the fact that you begin your story as an absolute nobody. Cannon fodder whose sole purpose is to become ground beef for the Emperor's war machine. But bit by bit, you fight your way up the ranks and the story is really two stories. It's what's going on on Atoma Prime, but it's also the story of your rise from lowly skid mark to valued, respected combat veteran. The story will be told in a few different ways, some of which Fat Shark aren't sharing quite yet. What they are talking about is the banter between different characters, since that will be the primary tool that Fat Shark will use to tell their story. Brief back and forth between the characters during missions will reveal information about their mission, the major factional players behind it, the locations they're exploring, the backstories of each playable characters, and more. That dialogue will in fact evolve as you become more known and more respected, and in an interview with Edge Magazine, Fat Shark told them that this dialogue between characters already has over 75,000 lines written, and more are coming as there's plans to evolve this story over time. Got talking to one of the sentries. Did you know Morrow was in the middle of the Xanatros purgation? Good for you. That's the other thing that's interesting about this. Fat Shark are really aiming to deliver an evolving narrative. They didn't use the word live service with me because I don't think that's quite what they're aiming for. But the story of what's going on on Atoma Prime, there's definitely the intention that that story unfolds over the span of months and potentially years. And similarly, your own story of rising through the ranks will continue to evolve as you notch more exploits. To deepen that connection to your own story, Dark Tide includes something Vermintide never did, a character creator. So sadly I can't show you this because it was still under construction, but I did use the tool to create a few characters and I can tell you that it was good. It wasn't Korean MMO good where you can place the individual freckles on someone's face, but it was solid enough that it let me create distinct characters that look notably different from the base character models. Skin was actually really good, which is a strange call out, I know, but it looked really detailed and leathery and when you put tattoos on it, they just look fantastic. You can select a backstory for your character, but this is more of an RP thing and you can name them and then they're yours. So like I said, it's not the best character creation tool I've ever used, but I'm pretty sure people will be happy with it. After I created my character, I was dropped into the hub. Now I have a very small amount of footage on this since it also is under construction and I had to kind of plead with Fat Shark to be able to show any of it. So this was all I could wrangle out of them, but this is the central chamber, which houses the computer with the missions on it. When you boot it up, you get a sort of map and you can choose from a variety of different missions. And these will rotate regularly, both in terms of their locations and objectives, but also the modifiers that might affect them. Outside of this chamber, there are a lot of empty rooms where stuff would eventually go. Stuff like a cosmetic shop and an armory and a place to tweak your talents. It was a big space, so I expect there will be lots of stuff there eventually, but for now it was pretty empty. Progression and unlocks are a big feature of Dark Tide, just as they were with Vermintide. Again, I don't have footage, but I've been assured that each character will have a talent tree with various stuff to unlock. There'll be weapons and armor and other wearable items, each of which buff stats in a variety of ways. There'll be unlockable cosmetics, but there will also be paid cosmetics. I'm not sure if there's going to be any gameplay affecting in-game purchases. I certainly hope not, and that's something I'll take a close look at when it comes time to review the final product. So, that's all the setup stuff. Let's head down to the hive. I only got to play through one level during these hands-on sessions. It was one set in the lower levels of the Great Hive City, home to 9 billion souls. And as soon as I got boots on the ground, I was like, damn, this looks, this looks pretty good. It's probably intellectually lazy to immediately think of Doom 3 whenever I encounter darkness plus flashlight plus industrial sci-fi. That's just how my brain works. And as soon as the mission began, I was immediately thinking like, hey, this is giving me Doom 3 vibes. 
That's a compliment more than anything else though, since to this day, few games have better mastered lighting and in particular contrast between light and shadow. Darktrite isn't trying to compete with that since it's far more interested in giving you enough light to see what's charging at you, but in between the major combat spaces, when the game is trying to slow things down and let you sink into the ambience of the hive, the use of dark space lit only by your torchlight was a bit of a go-to for Fat Shark, and I think it works super well. The cloistered nature of the level design makes for environments that are naturally very responsive to lighting changes. This example here where I throw a grenade is a really good showcase. So the lighting is fantastic. I think the environment design is really solid as well. The sense of scale that Dark Tide is able to achieve can be overwhelming at times. The hub area really nails this, but I can't show you that sadly. This section here is probably the next best example. The combination of megalomania and gothic and industria that is the hallmark of the 40k universe. It just looks awesome. I've definitely seen some concern about the sort of environment diversity that Darktide might deliver, since most of what we've seen to this point has all been set in this underbelly of the hive. Obviously, I don't know what to expect on this front, but I do note a line in that Edge preview that spoke about the likelihood of us visiting the more opulent upper levels of the Hive City, which would be awesome, because certainly whenever I've engaged 40k, it usually looked like this, and I'm definitely down for some variety. As for the actual level design, how it was laid out and how it was played, it was really good. It started in these sewer looking things, then there was this bridge crossing where things got totally wild, then we headed through some back streets and fought a mini boss, then we got to this sick looking outdoor area, we had to hold down this other area while we waited for a terminal to get hacked, and someone had to do the actual hacking when it got stuck so everyone else would have to hold off the waves. After that we got to this junction point where waves of enemies were coming down every aisle and it got totally crazy, and then we ended up in this, I don't even know how to describe it, it was just this big series of chambers, but this is where things got the most nuts with more enemies on screen at once than in any other point of the mission. After that we made our way through a slum which was built on an abandoned rail line, then we fought through the control center of the docks, and then we were on the docks where the objective was to collect some heavy duty explosives and transport them away. Sadly this did bug out, but we did get the gist of what we were supposed to be doing, and had it worked it would have been great. So that's a single mission that has by my count around 10 different major combat areas, each of them grounded in that underhive setting, but each of them quite distinct from one another. So if Fat Shark can deliver us, I don't know, 10 to 15 missions as good as that, and they can vary the setting so it doesn't all look like it's set in a foundry, then I think they'd be onto a good thing. One of the other really interesting things that Fat Shark told Edge Magazine was that not only will levels change in terms of enemies and bosses that spawn, but they're modular in their design so they can be combined together in different ways. Quote, Designers produce chunks of levels, then join five or six together to create a mission. Chunks can intersect each other, creating a bigger overall zone so that several missions can crisscross a single zone." End quote. Isn't that cool? It very much reminds me of Warframe's procedural generation where tiles can be combined dynamically to create unique feeling levels. I don't expect it'll be quite as freeform as what Warframe does, but it is cool to know that this sort of thing is on the table as it's surely going to reduce that feeling of repetitiveness that these co-op shooters can quickly suffer from, given that their mission layouts are almost always entirely static. Darktide will offer at least four classes at launch. There's plenty of speculation that there will be more over time. It's a pretty safe bet, but for day one, you're talking the Veteran, who's focused on precision damage, the Zealot, who seems to be focused on automatic weaponry, there's a Psyker, who's kind of the caster of the group, and then there's the Ogren, who is the big boy. I was chatting to the lead designer, Magnuson, about this, and he was telling me that the Ogren is so large that it really fucked their level design process, because when you make a character that big, you then need to make sure that every doorway is both wide and high enough for him to fit through. And Fat Shark went through all sorts of ideation on this, like having him kind of duck down when he went through smaller doorways. But eventually they just scrapped that and made sure that everything was big enough to fit him. So the mountain really came to Mahabhan on that one. Class identity is a combination of a bunch of stuff. There's obviously the lore for each class, where each one represents a different role within 40k's mess up society. It impacts class mechanics, like their shield for example, where the veteran's shield bar denotes his light armor, but the zealot denotes her faith in the emperor. 
One of the more notable impacts of your class decision is the activatable ability you gain access to. The Ogren, for example, will charge forward like an offensive lineman clearing a path for his quarterback. While the veteran will gain enhanced vision, highlighting priority targets and dealing bonus damage to armor. The most meaningful impact of your class decision though is that it determines which weapons you can bring into the field. I'm told to expect a lot of variations for each weapon type, but I got to play with the veteran's semi-automatic rifle and chainsword, the zealot's automatic rifle and her mallet, and the ogren's kit which is comprised of a sword that looks like a butter knife in his hand, as well as, you know I actually don't know what this is called, but it's really fucking cool. What I learned is that each weapon, melee and range, has an alt fire mode that's engaged in different ways. So for the Ogren's pellet gun, the default firing mode is this sort of single shot that makes it function like a shotgun, but if you activate the secondary fire, that's when it becomes this kind of cheese grater minigun thing. The melee weapons for both the Zealot and the Veteran can be activated, which electrifies it or turns on the chain part of the chainsaw. Sadly, I don't have any good footage of that, but if you recall Gears of War chainsaw kills, then you're most of the way there. No need for fancy shots. Earlier I mentioned that there were two reasons I didn't quite click with Vermintide. The first was that I didn't love the fantasy Warhammer stuff, but the second was that I don't love games that are focused on first person melee combat. And to be clear, Vermintide is pretty much the best first person melee combat you can get. It's really good, but it's just I don't love that style of play, and it's always stopped me from gelling with Vermintide the way many others did. Now to be clear, Vermintide has ranged combat, lots of it in fact, but it's not the focus. Your ranged weapon was either a backup, or it had a very deliberate single use kind of purpose, where it was intended that most of the time you'd be swinging at stuff with something heavy, or stabbing stuff with something pointy. So this is why I'm keen for Darktide, because it essentially flips that formula. Your ranged weapon is the go-to here, that is the weapon that you'll be most reliant on, switching to your melee weapon when you need to. This hasn't resulted in melee combat feeling any less meaningful or satisfying. All of the things that made melee combat great in Vermintide are here, including blocking, and pushing, and the responsiveness of enemies who will ragdoll in really convincing ways when you hit different parts of their body. In Darktide, melee is not this strictly optional thing you might do for fun, it's essential. The veteran, for example, is very much about precision damage, so his automatic rifle is great at range, but when enemies are up in your face, then you're gonna need to switch because the ranged weapon just loses most of its effectiveness in that setting. So I guess this brings us to gunplay, and I know that more than a few people were worried that Fat Shark wouldn't do this well since it hasn't been a part of their wheelhouse to this point, at least not in this way. I'm here to tell you that these weapons handle super well and feel great to use. The Ogren's cheese grater thing feels super satisfying, the Zealot's auto rifle has plenty of kick on it without feeling unwieldy, and the Veteran's battle rifle was my personal favorite since it felt so precise and produced such satisfying feedback every time I pulled the trigger. That was something I noticed actually. The size of enemy hitboxes was really big, it was very easy to land headshots. And I asked Magnuson about this and he said, yeah, we purposefully made them larger because we want the player to feel powerful and have fun. That's a design philosophy that's quite central to the way Fat Shark are designing Darktide. One of the most interesting reveals from the Edge preview was this bit. I read it out because it's really insightful. Quote, We anchor it in the purpose of wanting players to have a good time. Balancing it is about checking with players and quantifying how they're doing, not how the horde is doing. So enemies politely ask, is it a good time for me to try and shoot you? And you're like, no, I have just been shot three times and I have a pox walker trying to hit me. And so they'll shoot someone else. We need that level of balance because if we unleash 50 guys all trying to kill you at the same time, you're dead, pretty much, end quote. Now, as I was playing it, I kept thinking to myself that the pacing here was really good. I never felt frustrated. I mean, we were playing on a lower difficulty, sure, but there weren't any moments where I felt unfairly reamed or that shit was going down and I was like, ugh, that's lame. Having read that quote from Edge, I can see that lack of frustration was a deliberate design choice supported by this sophisticated game system. And it's one that actually underpinned Left 4 Dead, which is one of the reasons why that game worked as well as it did. This is in contrast to something like Back for Blood, where I think the defining characteristic of that game was how badly it managed its difficulty scaling and pacing, and how it would just relentlessly flood you with high level enemies no matter what was going on. That game really fell apart above the base difficulty, and hey, maybe Darktide makes the same mistake 
stakes at higher difficulties? I don't know. But the fact that Fat Shark are talking about this stuff and that they've designed this specific system to handle game pacing, I think that's a really good thing. So on that note, this is probably a good time to remind everyone that this is a preview and that while I really enjoyed what I played, it doesn't mean that the final product will be good. It's possible that it lacks content or it's full of bugs or it's got some shitty pay to win bullshit or I don't know, anything. Point is, don't pre-order, don't get overhyped. But personally, I'm moderately hyped for this because yeah, I had a really great time with it and it's just ticking a lot of boxes for me. I've been flirting with the 40k universe for a while, and if Dark Tide launches well, I can really see this as kind of a gateway drug into more 40k. That whole evolving storyline thing really intrigues me as well, since I'd love it if I could dip back into this world every three to six months as new content rolls out. That's something that I'm really enjoying about Destiny right now, and I know talking about Destiny is always complicated, but the reality is that narrative is steadily building both the Destiny universe and the characters that inhabit it, and it's awesome to periodically return to that game and see that slow build happening. If Darktide can give us a 40k storyline that evolves and expands over time, that'd be awesome. And that's setting aside the fact that this is probably going to be a really fun co-op shooter, and it's going to be on Game Pass, which I think is huge from an engagement perspective, since co-op shooters tend to be pretty boring unless you're playing them with your mates, so the low barrier to entry for this one is going to make it so much easier to enjoy. So that's Darktide, it's 40 US dollars, it's out on September 13th on Steam, it's on Xbox where it's day one Game Pass, I'm sure it's coming to PlayStation 5 at some point, Hopefully that exclusive window isn't long because this one is looking pretty great. So, one of the things I mentioned during this preview is that Dark Tide is exclusive to both PC and Xbox, at least for a little while. A real bummer for anyone with a PlayStation or a Switch or mobile gamers, they're gamers too. The good news is that you don't have to have an Xbox or a high-end PC to enjoy Dark Tide because it's gonna be available day one on NVIDIA GeForce Now powered by Pentanet. What is GeForce Now, you ask? It's a cloud gaming platform that lets you experience PC games running on high-end hardware without having to front the thousands of dollars for that hardware. And you can play those games on your TV, your old outdated PC and your Apple devices. This is possible because GeForce now does all the graphical processing in the cloud and just beams you an image similar to something like Netflix. So if you have an internet connection at 15 megabits per second or higher, you can start playing games through the cloud on almost any device through either a dedicated app or through a web browser like Apple Safari. So for example, this is me playing Watch Dogs Legion 1080p 60fps with ray tracing enabled on my phone. Pretty good, huh? But what if I don't want to use a phone? That's fine. This is footage of me playing Guardians of the Galaxy on my PC through the handy GeForce Now PC client. I just browse through the list of games I own, I boot it up, and within seconds, I'm playing Guardians of the Galaxy with ray tracing enabled. That is awesome because it means I don't have to spend thousands of dollars on a next gen GPU to enjoy a game like this at max settings with ray tracing. You can just play it through GeForce Now and save yourself the cash. GeForce Now powered by Pentanet is getting new games added all the time. For example, just last week, it got one of the biggest games on the market, Genshin Impact. Now, yes, you can play the mobile port of this already, but now instead of running a scaled back mobile version, you can play the PC port at max settings in the palm of your hand. That's a nice upgrade. You could even use the Nvidia Shield to access your Genshin account through GeForce Now, allowing you to play on a big screen TV with your game play upscale to 4K. The thing I love most about this service and the reason I'm recommending it to you is that GeForce Now powered by Pentanet respects your existing game libraries. You don't have to buy your games twice with GeForce Now. There's over 1,000 compatible games and more are being added every week. And if you own those games on Steam, Epic or Ubisoft Connect, then you can play them on either your local hardware or through GeForce Now. It's entirely up to you. Here's the craziest part. Pentanet are currently selling a founder's plan for GeForce Now where if you subscribe, it locks in the discount for the lifetime of your subscription. So when the price goes up in the future, you'll be laughing and you can spend those extra dollars on bulking out your game library. Give it a try and see for yourself how many games are available, how easy it is to load up and start playing games in your library, how smooth and reliable the connection is, all of it. I would love it if you guys did me a solid, click the link, signed up and checked it out. Not only because it would make Papa NVIDIA very happy, but also because I really think there is value 
value in this for you. If you want to play games on the go, if you want to be able to keep playing when you're rudely kicked off the TV, if you want to play PC exclusive games, but don't want to shell out the dosh for a PC. You can try it for free or you can sign up for a priority subscription to secure your founder's price. And like I said, your founder's price will be locked in for the full lifetime of your subscription. So it's a great time to sign up. The link is below. Like I said, it's free, nothing to lose. So give it a click, sign up. Thanks GeForce Now, powered by Pentanet for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.